So, Father, we come before you today, Lord. We thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that it's able to transform our lives. And, Lord, we ask that you'd speak to us today and change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today, I want to talk, the title of my message is Mending Nets. I want to talk about the whole concept of what a net is and how we're to use it as believers, okay? And um, we're going to start in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 to 6. It says here, all right, and so I want you to see what uh, the scripture is saying here in Malachi. It says, look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. How many know that we've been living in a dispensation of grace? We're living in a time where God is pouring out his mercy. He's pouring out his grace. He's, he's got the door of the ark open. He's saying, come on in, you know, don't face judgment. But th- that time will come to an end, and it'll be a time of judgment that's going to come, right? So we're in a dispensation of grace. And this is what Malachi is talking about here. He's saying that um, there's a dreadful day of the Lord that's coming and is preaching the preaching of Elijah which speaks of the mantle prophetic mantle will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers otherwise I will come and I will strike the earth with a curse and so it's interesting to note this that God is interested in healing broken hearts See, God, is, God wants to see people heal. God wants to see people whole. He wants to see people restored. And the end time message, how many, know we're, how many believe we're in the end days? So the end time message has to be a message of restoration. It has to be a message of, listen, God wants to heal your heart. He wants you to be, a, he wants you to be his son and daughter. But he wants you to mature to be a mother and father who produces sons and daughters, who grow up to be mothers and fathers that produce sons and daughters. How many know this is what it's about? And so everything we do as a church has to be through the heart of a mother and father. Because that's what God's trying to produce. Culture um, of mothers and fathers and sons and daughters is what God is doing. And I love the, the story of the prodigal son. How many know that story? And, you know, the prodigal son goes out and he, he, takes, he takes what portion of the inheritance is his and he goes out and he spends it all on wild living. And then he ends up at the bottom of the barrel working for a pig farmer and he doesn't even have money for food, so he's eating the, the pods that were meant for the pigs. How, how many know the story? And then he comes to his sense, he says, even my father's servants have it better than this, so I'm going to go back to my father. So he starts going back to his father with his head down, full of shame, full of pig poop, right? Pierre used to tell this story really well. Remember Pierre? Pig boy. He used to call him pig boy. And he would come back and he'd be smelly. How many know that he didn't, probably didn't have a shower? He came back smelly, beaten up. And the father saw him a long way off, the scripture says, and he ran to him, embraced him, and kissed him in all his filth. And I believe that as, as if we have hearts like mothers and fathers, as people are coming in, we need to embrace them in their filth. And then we clean them up. Or I should say God cleans them up. But we need to be willing to embrace people where they're at. And that's what the heart of a father looks like. You take your kids... How many know our kids mess up sometime, but we still love them, right? How many still love your kids when they mess up? All right, a few hands went up. The rest of you, if you have parents in the room, you're in trouble. But most of us, I'll try that again. Hands up, okay, there's a few of us. Okay, good, awesome. Um, But here's the thing. If God's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, how does he do it? Well, if you go in context and you reverse in Malachi to the beginning of the chapter, we'll see what God is saying. And Malachi chapter 4, verse 2 to 3. But for you who fear my name, if, for those who have reverence for the name of Jesus, your, your faith is not just a, hey, I'm a Christian, but you actually have reverence for God, okay? The Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. It's a pretty good promise. And you will go free. You'll be leaping with joy like the calves, okay? Uh, like uh, being led out to pasture. On the day when I act, you will tread upon the wicked, the Bible says, as if they were dust under your feet. This is a great passage. How many people, uh, you know, how many Christians do you know, maybe you're one of them, where it's almost like there's constant bondage. You're not treading on the wicked. The wicked seems to be treading on you. And here's a promise where God is saying, if you will fear my name, the Son of Righteous will arise with healing in his wings, and you will go free, leaping with joy. 
A church should be the happiest places. If we're free in God, we should be leaping with joy. We should be smiling. We should be happy. Doesn't mean you won't have trials. Doesn't mean you won't have persecution. But you'll soar over the valleys instead of living in them. And God wants us to be a people who are living in this type of freedom. And so I take this word, healing. The son of righteous will rise with healing in his wings. And this is what it means here. Okay, It's a word marpa, which actually means a medicine. It means a cure, deliverance, and wholesome. Okay? And, and so here's the thing. God wants us to, to have freedom in our lives. He wants us to walk in victory, and he wants us to be free. So in other words, the healing of Jesus produces in us the message of adoption, which produces freedom, and, 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 it, and it produces also authority. So you have freedom in your life because of the cross. You have freedom in your life because of what God is doing in your life. But now you also have authority so you can tread on the works of the enemy as if it's dust under your feet. Now, when it says your enemies will be dust under your feet, we know he's not talking about other people. Because the Bible says that we're to love our enemies, and it says in the New Testament that, you know, you know that we don't fight against flesh and blood. We fight against spirits of wickedness in heavenly places. So our goal is to get to a place where the healing of God is flowing so strong that it's just dust under our feet. How many know you can walk? This is where God is taking us to as a church. He wants us to be a place where healing flows and lives are changed. We believe that God has called this church to be a place of healing, and we will assimilate God's word till it produces the proper fruit of deliverance in our lives. Amen? assimilate God's word, read it, and, and make sure, we're, because if you assimilate it correctly, you're going to have freedom. Jesus said uh, that those who believe in me, as the scriptures have said, out of their belly will flow rivers of living water. Okay, not rivers of death, not gossip and hurt, but living water. Amen? So I want to talk about nets this morning uh, as we're looking at the scripture here in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 to 22. This is the first time that Jesus met Peter and Andrew, and he was calling them to be disciples. And it says here, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon and Peter, Simon Peter and Andrew his brother, casting nets into the sea. For they were fishermen, and he said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they immediately, say immediately, left their nets, and followed him. And so they immediately went. But I want you to see something. There was two people casting nets. I'm going to ask someone to kind of open this net up for me because I don't know how to open it up here. Can you open that up for me, brother? Someone lent me that net today, and I haven't opened it up yet. So, Scott, Scott did. Thank you, Scott. It's never been used before, right? That's good. So here's the net, okay, and um, they were casting their nets. Now, this, of course, is not the type of net they would use, but it gives you an idea, right? So this is the kind of net that you just scoop up your fish, right, when you're fishing, and you scoop them up, and then you put them on the boat, all right? And so they were out fishing with their net. I'll just put that here for a second. But they had a big, big, big net that they just let in, and all the fish swam into it, and they pulled it up, right? But you get the idea. Um, but immediately they left, they left their nets and they went and they followed Jesus. Now we're going to go down to verse 21. We're going to continue. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. Okay? And he called them and immediately, say immediately, they left their boat and their father to follow him. And so we have two groups of people. We have two people that are casting their nets and we have two people that are mending their nets. All right? So we have two things going on, but both groups of men decide to follow Jesus, okay? And allegorically, Jesus is telling them that they will become fishers of men. You were, not, you were fishing for fish, but now I want to make you fishers of men. Allegorically, we will talk about mending and casting nets and the difference between the two of them. So when we become followers of Jesus, we become mission-minded people, okay? 
And so the mission of the church, all of you probably know this, or most of you do, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of all nations. And so God wants us to be on mission. And when he was calling the disciples and saying, come be followers of me, he was saying, I'm bringing you on mission to reach people. No longer are you just going to catch fish to feed the hungry naturally. You're going to go out and catch people for God. This was the new call, the new mandate that God was calling them into. And so the net, the, we, we understand symbolically the water represents the world. We understand that fish represent people. And the nets are the instruments we use to harvest the catch. All right? So I want to say this. There's two seasons in church life or in the Christian life, and that is this, times to mend the nets and times to cast them. Times to mend the nets and there's times to cast the nets. And sometimes you're doing it at the same time, but these two seasons are always happening. And if you neglect one or the other, you'll not be a happy Christian. You're going to have issues, okay? The net can represent three things. It represents the message. Say the message. And the message, of, the message, if it's preached correctly, has power to bring transformation so that you can build teams. The next one is teams. Teams are the relationships which create a foundation for the function of your gift. Say, I have a gift. And your gift needs to be in function in the house of God. And so the message brings a, transforms your life, transforms the lives of people to establish teams and relationships so that you have a, a foundation for your gift to flow. And the next one is programs. Programs are designed which create a system for the process of bringing people into the kingdom of God. Does that make sense, everybody? But in order to catch fish, you can't have holes in your net. How how many know you'd be pretty discouraged if you went fishing and every time you pull the net, you're like, there's nothing in the net. Well, there's holes in the net. And that's the problem, right? And so, uh, and I want you to understand this, that that I had a fishing pole here. Here's a fishing pole. God doesn't use a fishing pole to fish. He doesn't. And you know the nice thing, how many fishermen do we have here? Some here? We've got a great fisher over here. Another fit. You're a fisherman? Awesome. You're a fisherman? Good. When you fish with a pole, you can only catch one fish at a time, first of all. But the other thing is with fishing with a pole, is when you're fishing with a pole, you get to choose the bait. I want, if you want to catch bass, you put a certain bait on there. If you want to catch catfish, you can use it. Catfish will eat anything. But you, 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 you want certain bait for certain fish. How many hear what I'm saying? And, and, and you know what? Some churches, I'm not, I'm not going to point fingers or say I know who they are, but some churches will, will bait the hook. Say, well, I'm going to preach this message because I want to attract this people. I'm going to preach on prosperity because I want all those people that have a love for money to gather so they can give me good offerings. No, I didn't say that. Um, I'm going to preach on this. I'm going to preach this message, and I'm not going to talk about repentance because I want to get all, I want to get all the young people to come out. I don't want to, I don't want them to feel condemned, so I won't preach this part of the word. I'll just bait it with these scriptures, and I'm going to cast it out. I'm going to catch the fish I want to catch so they're, they have the right fish in my church. How many hear what I'm saying? But God doesn't do that. God throws out a net. So this net goes out, and you pull in the net, and you open the net, and you got fat fish, skinny fish, ugly fish, polka dot fish. You got fish that hiss at you. How many have you ever had a fish? Anyone have have a, a fish that hisses at you? And it's like, well, where'd that come from? You have crabby fish. You have sharp fish, and you're like, man, God, I don't know if I want these fish. They're going to hurt me, man. Like, I, I, wanted, I wanted rainbow trout, and now i got all this stuff, right? And you end up with all kinds of fish, and God brings them in, and you don't have a choice. Because we broadcast the word of God, and we catch the harvest that comes in. Amen? Amen. So we don't have a choice who comes to church. God draws them. God's net goes out, and it's the message of the gospel. As we preach the gospel, it's a net that is cast out, and it pulls in the people that God wants to pull in. Amen? God fishes with a net, not with a pole. And so, um, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 21, the term for mending nets 
is the same word that's found in Galatians 6 verse 1, which means to restore. We want to mend, we want to restore relationships to conform to God's design. The word conform actually means, uh, it's the word katarizo, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, which means to set in order, to equip, to adjust, to complete what is lacking, to make fully, to repair, to prepare. And so there's times in our lives where God wants us to step back and set in order our lives, to equip ourselves, to complete what is lacking, and to repair what needs to be repaired so that when we're cast out, we're going to catch the fish. Does that make sense? And you say, well, I'm not a preacher, but I'll tell you what, you are because you have a testimony. And your testimony is the message, it's the net that you're casting out to pull in lives into the kingdom of God. We see this word in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 to 2. It says this, Brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, say any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so when we're mending nets, what we're doing is we're restoring people. We're bearing one another's burdens. We're building one another up. How many hear what I'm saying? And so say there's seasons for mending and there's seasons for casting. And we see in Colossians chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, it says, I want you to know, Paul is speaking, how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and I want them to be knit together, say knit together, by strong ties of love. It's the love of God that knits us together. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ himself. Say, Lord, I want to be tied together with the bonds of love. And so the enemy wants to get us, sometimes we get focused on like, we got to win the world, we got to win the world. But there's, there's holes in the net. And it's, it's, there's two seasons. And I believe in the last few years, we've been in a season of mending, and we're about to move into a season of casting. Amen? So, so God's about to do something new. God's about to cast us as a church to, to, to reach the lost because he's been mending us for the last few years and knitting us together. But here's how some churches miss it. They become a mending church only. And the danger with becoming a mending church only is uh, you never move into the season of casting and it's a two-season process. If you don't go into a season of casting, you're not moving into assignment. And if you're not moving into assignment, there's no purpose for your life. And depression comes in. And people start sitting in church and going, God's presence isn't here anymore. I used to get so excited when Don sang worship, and now it's just, I'm not excited anymore, and the sermons aren't feeding me. I just feel dry inside. What's the problem? The problem is that we miss the season of casting. Do you hear what I'm saying? We need to move through those seasons. We don't want to become a mending church, a mending church only. Another way churches can miss it is by becoming a casting church only. Yeah, we're the, we're the evangelism church, man. We win the city for Jesus. That's what we do. We have all these programs. We go on the highways and the byways. And we reach people for Jesus. We preach the gospel. And, and, and hardly anybody comes. I don't know what's wrong. And, and if you become a casting church only, you continue casting the nets with holes in it, and it creates dysfunctional Christians. Because if we're all dysfunctional and we're not dealing with our stuff, say, we got stuff. Okay, Pastor Travis has got issues. 
I'm not who I was. I'm being transformed by his glory. I'm being transformed, but I got a ways to go, and you do too. But, but if, if, if we don't deal with our stuff, guess what? We, we, people come into the church, you cast the net, and if some way, somehow, they don't slip through the, the, the hole and they get caught somehow in the net, they come in and they walk in, they go, this is a dysfunctional place, man. Like nobody said hi to me when I came in the door. Everybody looks like they drank lemon juice for breakfast. I mean, is, is it, maybe, maybe I'll go down the street and check something else out. Because somehow we miss the mending season, which has to do with the sun rising with healing in his wings. And we, we haven't had time to bask in the Son of God's presence so that we can transform the people when they come in. And so there's seasons of mending and there's seasons of casting. And so I want to take a few minutes here. Because what happens, the danger of just being a casting church is Christians get discouraged and they lose their faith. And I was part of a church at one point, years ago, where I went for a season, where it was an evangelistic church, and the preacher every Sunday was having altar calls. The church was going out into the streets and preaching the gospel and handing out tracts and casting out devils. And, and it was just like, it was go, 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 go. But there was all of these issues in the church. And everybody was just kind of, there's a pink elephant in the room. Where? I didn't see it. There's issues in the house of God. Nobody wanted to deal with it. And my job was I was assigned to be the guy who uh, would call up all the people who came to the altar and do follow-up. And somehow the pastor and the anointing and the presence of God would draw them to the altar to get saved. But when I tried to do the follow-up call, hey man, do you want to get together for a coffee? Can I put you in our alpha course or whatever? They'd be like, no, I'm not interested. I changed my mind. Or they'd come back and just be, kind of see the issues and say, yeah, I'm not really that interested. So I started bringing people to the church because he was a great pastor and he could get people saved. They get saved, and then I'd start taking them to another church on the side. I was kind of dating somebody else at the same time, right? Because the other church was healthy. And they kind of fit in and began to... Fl- Do you hear what I'm saying? And Our church has to be a place where we feel comfortable bringing the unsaved, bringing people who've never heard the gospel, where we know they're going to they're gonna get a handshake, they're going to get a smile, they're going to be told, hey, God loves you and has a plan for your life. You know you're dirty, but I'm going to hug you anyway. You're a little smelly, smell a little bit like pig, but you know what, I'm not going to tell you that because that would offend you, but I'll hug you. I'm going to pull you in and we're going to show you the process of healing that we went through and we're going to help you to go where God's called you to go because God has a vision for your life and a plan for your life. Amen? Amen. And so I want, I want to just take a few minutes in Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 7. This is the actual story of what took place when Jesus met them for the first time. Can I go for a few more minutes? Okay. So it was as the multitudes pressed around him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of uh, Gennesaret. I don't know if I said that right, but anyway. And saw two boats standing by the lake, and the fishermen uh, had gone from them and were, were washing their nets. The other, uh, you know, in Mark it says they were mending their nets. And then he got into the boats which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little from the land. And Jesus sat and taught the multitudes from the boat. And when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Okay? And so we are letting down our nets, plural, okay, for a catch. You see that? This is why it's important. Like, if you go back to the original King James, um, there's stuff that's there that you miss in a lot of the other translations. So if you're studying, go back to the King James. It's the authorized version. You'll see stuff you won't catch in any other translation. I'm not saying it's evil to read another translation, but if you're studying. Okay, so see what Jesus says here. Every other translation says Jesus said, let down your net, but it didn't. The original translation, he said, let down your nets, plural. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have been toiling all night. We've caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net, singular. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. And so because they were partially obedient and not fully obedient, they couldn't hold the harvest of fish. 
And so I want to say this, as a church, we have to be fully obedient. When God says, let down your nets, when you, uh, we want you to put these programs into place, we want you to do connect groups, we want you to, we want you to preach this message, we want you to build teams, uh, we can't just say, okay, well, we're just going to try it. No, we have to be fully obedient so that when the harvest comes, we can contain it. Amen? But we tried this before, Lord, and it never worked. We used to do street evangelism in the past, and it never worked. We used to do this, and we used to go to the old age homes, and I know you're asking us to do it again, but we used to do it, and it didn't bear any fruit, God. We used to do this, we used to do that, and it didn't work before. But nevertheless, if you're asking us to, we're going to do it. But then we have to be fully obedient, because when God's word goes forth, there's power to bring in the harvest. Amen? I'll be obedient at your word, Lord. God is asking for full obedience. Wow. Wow. And they had done this. They caught a great number of fish. Their nets were breaking. So they signaled to their partners and the other boats to come and help them. And they came and they filled both the boats. So they began to sink. Man, if God brings revival, which he will, I believe revival's coming. When revival, I don't care if we have to send people to other churches. Let's just get them in the boats. Let's fill them up. This is not about our church. This is not about our kingdom. It's God's kingdom. This is not Pastor Travis's or Peter's or any of the, it's not our church. It's Jesus's church, and he's going to build his church. Amen? (laughs) Hallelujah. Wow. In John chapter 21, verse 3 to 11, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be closing soon with this passage. But with the first time Jesus met the disciples, the four disciples, and calling them into ministry was a passage we just read about. But now, after he was risen from the dead on his thir- third visitation, he has already risen from the dead, and he goes out and he finds Simon Peter. And he says, Simon Peter, he said, uh, Well, let's just read it. Because, you know, what happened with Simon Peter and the other disciples, they were discouraged because they're walking with Jesus or talking with Jesus or doing life with Jesus. Now Jesus dies. Jesus is gone. He's only appeared twice. So when men don't know what they do, know what to do, they say, I have nothing to do. I'm confused. I don't know what to do with myself. Jesus is not here anymore. What are we going to do? So this is where we're going to start here. So Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. How many men have ever felt like that? You know, like... I don't want to go, I'm going fishing. And so they said to him, the other disciples, we're going with you. And they went out and they immediately got into the boat and, and, and um, uh, they got immediately into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. He did the, the disguise thing. And Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast their nets now, okay, and they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. So he's like doing the same miracle a second time. And and all of a sudden, they they realize, Peter, I'm just going to summarize it. Peter realizes, hey, this is Jesus. He puts his clothes on, dives in the water. He's swimming up to the shore. And in verse 11, it says, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land, full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net would not break. And it's so important that we understand that, you know, John actually writes about this. They literally counted the fish. They could have said, okay, there was there was a hundred and some, but no, they counted one, two, and they were amazed at two things. They were amazed that there was 153 fish, and they were amazed that the net did not break. And here's the thing, 153 in the Hebrew, there's a numeric value that actually translates sons of Elohim. And I believe Jesus was trying to get a message to the disciples saying, what are you guys doing? You left your business of fishing. You're supposed to be fishing for men. And as they counted, they realized God's trying to get a message to us. He wants us to catch the sons of Elohim. Amen? Amen. When Jesus met Martha at the tomb, or Martha met Jesus at the tomb, uh, he said to her, he said, you know what, I'm going to my father right now. I'm going to my father and your father. I'm going to my God and your God. 
In other words, he's saying, you, you're a son of Elohim. You're, you're brought into the family of God. And so they were amazed. They go, man, God's getting a message to us. We're to catch the sons of God, those who are, God is reaching out to bring into, by adoption, into the kingdom of God. The other thing, it, w- it was the third time since Jesus showed himself to the disciples after the resurrection. That's another key that's put in the passage. Why would it matter whether it was the third time or the sixth time? But he said, no, it was the third time. Three represents the power of the resurrection. And unlike the old covenant, the new covenant, the new testament, the net can hold the increase. Amen? Amen? Because the anointing will hold the increase. And here's the thing. The net, we are the net. And I just want to call a few of you up. Maybe Camilla, if you want to come up, and Chris and Allison, Alex and Sarah, come up here for a second. When we allow the Holy Spirit to link us together, just lift my arm. We're linked together as a family. And I find out that, you know, Allison's going through a real tough time. And me and Camilla come over and say, Hey, Allison, you, you got a burden. We want to help you. We want to care for you. And they might do the same for us. We begin to care for one another's burdens. What we're doing is we're mending the relationships so we become united in one. And as we move forward, we will catch the fish. You know, I think of this story. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. I think of this story. It's not a story, actually. It's, it's a really sad situation. It happens all the time. But if someone drowns, if a child drowns on a beach, what, do the, what does the community do? They link arms, and they begin to walk. And every person is thinking the same thing. I hope I don't step on the body. Right? But when you're linked together, you're going to catch what you're looking for. But if everyone's divided and kind of walking wherever they want to walk, guess what? The, the fish are going to go by. There's, there's nothing to, to hold the harvest. And so over the last two or three years, what we've been doing with the, with the connect groups and with the partnership is we're trying to link together. We're not trying to be legalistic to say you're in or you're out. No, we're trying to link together in partnership, in relationship, to have honest conversations, to talk about the pink elephant in the room so we can deal with the issues that need to be dealt with. In fact, I'm going to start taking a bag of chocolate, a bag of prizes to our partnership meetings. So the first person who will stand up and say, I kind of disagree with you, Pastor, I'll give them a candy for being honest. Instead of disagreeing and then going, I'm not saying anyone does this, but some people disagree and then they go, they go home and they talk to everybody and say, hey, you know, I don't agree with this. Well, no, just tell me. And let, let, let's have honest conversations. Let's, let's work on our relationships. Let's process together. Let's break the spirit of religion. Let's give the enemy no place in the house of God. Amen? That's all we do. We link together. And as we link together, as New Covenant Christians, when the net is cast, we're going to catch lots of fish. I'm going to read this last passage of Scripture, and then I'm going to close in Romans chapter 8, um, verse 35. It says, Can anything separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean, uh, you know, that he no longer loves us if we have troubles or calamity? Anyone have troubles or calamity? Or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scripture says, for your sake we're killed all day long and, and we're being slaughtered like sheep. This is the early church losing their life. Uh, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Jesus Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing ever can separate me from the love of God. Neither death nor life, angels or demons, fears for today or worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. There's only one thing that will separate you. That's if you choose to jump out of the net and say, I don't want to be in this thing. But aside from that, nothing else can ever take you away from God. Isn't that a good message? God, you're so faithful, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And so our vision here at the church is this. We really believe that we exist as a church to make disciples, raise up leaders, and to plant churches. And next week, I'm going to share a little bit more about how, 
what that's going to look like practically. All right? And here's the next thing. Our mission is to live like Jesus and to share his love. That's it. Because so many times, I think, as Christians, if we just go back to the Gospels, who Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And the religious people were mad at Jesus because he hung out with prostitutes and tax collectors and people that were smelly pig boys. And he hung out with them, and it really bothered the religious people. But if we go back and look, how did Jesus deal with this situation? How did Jesus address this? What was Jesus like? Jesus met in small groups, and there was relationship, discipleship. That's why we meet in connect groups, so we can have relationship and talk and build each other up, right? So we want to live like Jesus and share his love. It doesn't get simpler than that, amen? That's our mission, all right? And the next slide here, these are some of our NEND Net mending programs that we're going to have coming up. The Encounter Weekend. How many have been doing Encounter Weekend? We've been doing them for 16 years now. And uh, the Breaking the Chains That Bind really is about dealing with, you know, trash from your past. And God, how many here, let me see your hand if you were touched in an encounter. Let me see your hand. Like, just transform. And we have people that the Lord has called on to other churches that are no longer here that have been through an encounter. Their life was transformed by it, right? And I'm telling you, it's a life transforming thing. You have to go to that. The second thing is highway to wholeness, which is healing the, uh, the whole person. Healing the whole person has to do with, um, uh, you know, renewing your mind and how to walk in victory and understanding how to uh, get divine healing flowing in your life. It's powerful. We're starting that in November. Uh, you know, we're going to have cards out next week for you to take home, and you can sign up online. And then we have a partnership course, uh, which is partnership, partnering basically in vision. You come in, you say, hey, I love the church. I feel like I'm going to partner with you guys, and we're going to, like, win the harvest and raise people up. So that's kind of what we're doing. And the other thing that's not up there, which should be up there, is Caring for the Heart, because Caring for the Heart is a ministry that we've been doing for um, marriage counseling and also for people who are married that want to bring healing to their marriage uh, and healing to relationships, so that's important. Some of our net casting programs is the Purple Book, which is a discipleship course. Some of you have taken that. Uh, the Connect Groups, very important. Youth Ministry, Preteen Ministry, Men and Women's Ministry, and Prayer Ministry. So all these things, they're nets that we're casting. We, we, we've been mended. We're continuing to be mended. But now we're casting nets because we want to catch people and bring them into discipleship in the house of God. Amen?